and welcome to another amazing episode of Finding the Superpowers Within. I am your host, Dr. April J. Lisbon, your workplace autism advocate. Today, I am super excited to have our guest, Ms. Haley Moss Esquire. I could tell you all of the great things that Haley has accomplished in her, long, her young life, but I want Haley to share her story. And the reason why I want her to share her story is to give other parents and other individuals on the spectrum an opportunity to see how you can make a difference in your life if given the opportunities and the supports and services in place. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome Ms. Haley Moss. Haley, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Dr. April. It is an absolute pleasure to get to talk to you again and get to hang out with you for a little bit. Great. So once again, please tell our listening audience who are not familiar with your story, who you are and some, maybe like one or two accomplishments that you have uh, made within the last, oh my gosh, you're, you're a millennial. What do you guys do? <laughs> In the last five to six years. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to go just by the last five to six years, somehow I've managed to graduate college and law school in the last five years, which is pretty wild to me because I'm like, wait, hold on. We're thinking 2015. I'm like, well, I graduated college in 2015 and I graduated law school in 2018. So I'm done with my education for now. That might, that may or may not change. Who knows? But a little bit about me is I am an attorney. I'm an author. So I'm the author of two books right now. I'm the author of Middle School, The Stuff Nobody Tells You About and A Freshman Survival Guide for College Students on the with Autism Spectrum Disorders. I'm quite proud of that. I'm also an artist. So I love to draw and illustrate and do all that fun stuff. And of course, I am an advocate. So the things that I really care about are making sure that disability rights are human rights and at the forefront and with justice and that people with disabilities do have access to justice. And I also am a huge nerd about autism and neurodiversity in the workplace. I love getting to talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act and also compliance and all that kinds of stuff too. So all sorts of things that I find interesting and exciting and I love getting the chance to help educate people and help them feel empowered. I love it. So one question that I want to ask and I'm sure our listening and viewing audience would want to know, and we'll get into the other questions later on, what got you interested in law? Really, what, what, what sparked that, that fire for you? So I always tell people that I am not the kid that you thought was going to grow up to be a lawyer, like whatsoever, because I think everyone has this very cookie cutter idea of what a lawyer should be, especially even with children. So we think of the very loud kid that's always raising their hand, the smart aleck, the kid that's on the debate team. And that was never me. I was very quiet. I also was an autistic little kid. I was late to talk. I didn't start having novel speech necessarily until I was in pre-K and even then it was echolalia and most of the stuff that I would start saying that was not exactly just repeating things I've heard was maybe like the first grade. I did drama at one point. I was always drawing and painting and doing other things so no one really thought of me as like the lawyer to be. That was not something that was expected and when I was in college I thought I was going to go to med school. I majored in psych. And when I first got to college, I thought the coolest thing in the world would be to be an autistic psychiatrist. I thought it would be the greatest thing in the world to be able to understand people and be able to help them with their problems. Because I've always been a good listener of the friend group. I always just found it really interesting. But then I took chemistry and it didn't go very well, as it does for a lot of other freshmen. And I realized I didn't even like the sciences that much to begin with. So back to square one, what do I enjoy doing? I love to write. And I actually, even though I was always kind of quiet socially and still am, I love to talk about things I care about. And I love, and I know that no matter what I did, I had to be able to give back to others. And law sort of fit all those objectives on paper for me. And it wasn't really until I got into law school and started learning more about how policy interacts with law, like not just even litigating or interpreting or representing somebody, but even policy. I'm like, this is something that I really care about and really like. So that's how I got into learning more about the ADA and what disability rights laws do. Even though I'm not practicing in disability rights, I love getting to know how all these things affect our daily lives. And lawyers do have the ability to make a difference every single day. I love it. That's wonderful. So my first question that I want to ask you is, when did you officially learn that you were on the autism spectrum? 
So I know a little bit about your story that um, at age three was when he finally officially got the, the diagnosis. Mm-hmm. But when did your parents actually tell you that you were autistic? I was nine. And we had that conversation in a very positive environment. So that summer, probably before I think the fourth grade, I think that's when you're not, I was nine. Try to make sure I'm right on this, but I will have to probably check with my mom later. <laughs> but that summer, I was obsessed with Harry Potter. And one day my mom says that you have magical powers just like Harry Potter. And being nine years old, of course, I'm going to, you know, believe it. So I'm interested in hearing this out. And she explains to me what autism is. And we focus a lot on the strengths and the positives. So not so much talking about the things that I'm struggling with or not making friends or being friends with all the boys or all that other stuff. We spend a lot of time talking about the good things like that I'm creative in my memory and that I was good at school and that I was a good listener that all these other things so we focused a lot on the strengths and that in tying it back to Harry Potter Harry Potter was different from the muggles he lived with so the non-magic folks mm-hmm. and but when he got to wizarding school he was also different from the other wizards and witches mm-hmm. but he was still the hero of the story so my mom kind of in dad were instilling me that different isn't better or worse it's just different and different could be extraordinary. So you could, you too could basically be the hero of the story. And it wasn't, I always thought it was really cool. So I never thought of myself as less or I never really had that doubt other than just regular teenager doubt of like, yeah, I wish I was cooler sometimes, or I wish that I had more friends, or I wish that I wasn't scared of driving. And I wish I knew how to park in the lines because it would be really cool to do some of those like teenagery things. But other than that, I never really had that, like, I wish I was neurotypical feeling. I still don't have that. I love that. And thank you so much for, for mentioning that because sometimes, you know, even in my circle as an ally, I do find that there are, you know, some individuals who want their children to be um, typically developing or, you know, they want a cure for it. And so it's wonderful to hear how your parents, mm-hmm. your particular diagnosis and how they aligned it with something that you were very passionate about to show you your strengths. And it seems like that's, that's the greatest gift that they gave you, which then led you to some of the other things that mm-hmm. you've been able to experience and accomplish this far in your young life. Would you Absolutely. say that? I think, I think it's really important to meet your kids where they are and to enter their world and see what they see. Because here's the thing. I think we all see the world very differently. And just the way that I experience it isn't the same as you may experience it. And that's totally natural. And I think just encouraging those strengths and fostering them is really important because it makes us happy. It builds self-esteem and confidence. Like I was always a confident kid. I never thought I was the weird kid. Even if I was the weird kid, I didn't know. I thought I was the coolest one there and everyone else didn't get it. So I had the complete opposite attitude as so, as so, unlike so many like other autistic peers that I know that had that. And I also think it's interesting when people talk about cure and stuff, because I'm also like, I don't want to be neurotypical, but I do support research that can improve quality of life, 100%. That if we can give more access to communication for those who might be non-speaking or have more difficulties communicating, if we can give more options and access to communication, I'm all for it. If we can solve some of the sleep issues, the anxiety, some of the other more negative things that come along with autism, that would be wonderful. So I'm by no means against that. I think science has a lot of power to do good things. It's just how far we take it and what those consequences could be. But I'm all for improving quality of life no matter what. I love it. I love it. So that's kind of the fair and balanced approach, I think. And that's kind of the mediator in me that's like, there's the no research side is wrong and the cure only side is wrong. But I do think that there's a happy medium that everybody can kind of agree on. Yes, I love that. And that is just make quality of life better because we should be we're in this world we deserve to be in this world and might as well grow up to be as happy and have as fulfilling lives as we can i agree with you so now tell us what trials and triumphs did you experience during your school years or even on the job i feel like there's a lot to unpack but i'm trying to think of what kind of is the largest thing overall and I think something that you experience no matter whether you're in school or the workplace or even out in society is you will have to deal with the negative stigmas associated with autism and other disabilities so and the prejudices and stereotypes which all boil down to the concept of ableism which is like how our society values 
people without disabilities and the negative stereotypes and connotations associated with disability and disabled folks. Mm -hmm. So it comes in a lot of different forms, whether people think you're not capable of something, they're excluding you, they're bullying you, or just realizing that an event or some part of your schooling or education is just inaccessible to how you learn. Mm -hmm. So there's so many different ways that this looks. It can look like the professor who told me halfway through my law school career, congratulations on being admitted. It can look like my friends who chose not to invite me to a social outing thinking that I didn't want to go because it was loud instead of giving me the choice to decide if it was too much for me, that these things could look very different. Depend or it could even look like a teacher not presenting visual information when you're a visual learner and, if, and insisting that everything has to be auditory. So that kind, that kind of bias, because it's not always outward discrimination, but it is definitely bias at the least. And that bias is something that I realize that you're navigating no matter what. And that's when parent allies, especially I think when we're younger, we don't realize what exactly it is are so important. Mm -hmm. So I think it really, and I think even about making friends has always been really difficult. I think about things like that and I'm like, how can we do better? Thank you so much for sharing. So tell me one or two things you would want to tell your younger self on how to move through your journey. I think I would tell my younger self to have faith, have faith because you always, I think when you're young, you're always scared. Like I have no idea what I'm doing. And I still feel that way sometimes because it's still like you have your whole life ahead of you. I'm only 25. I don't know what I'm doing for the rest of my life yet. And I'm learning to tell myself that's okay. Just like I would have told 15 year old me like, Hey, it's okay. Cause 15 year old me was like, yeah, I think I'm going to go to med school. I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe I'm going to apply to art school. I don't know, but I never ended up applying to art school. And I was also like, scared to live away from home and all this other stuff. And I would probably tell my younger self, it's gonna be okay. And also eat more pizza because I didn't, I've always been a very picky eater and it's something that I'm still trying to work through and I'm not doing very well at it. Mm -hmm. But I think in my early teen years, I discovered pizza and it was a game changer for me socially. And as far as it's one of my favorite foods and it makes me very happy. And I wish I had discovered it when I was younger cause I probably would have had a lot more friends at birthday parties. I also, it. I missed out on many good years of lots of good pizza. Yes, yes. Just because I didn't know better and I was afraid to try something new. So yes. don't be afraid, even though I'm still trying to work through that now. So it's really interesting because the things we would tell our younger selves sound really great in theory. And then in practice, we're like, we're still struggling with the same stuff. Mm -hmm. You're right. You're right. And I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, as you're talking about same food. So my son, um, you know, he he's willing to expand his food choices but the one thing that he will never he will not touch is milk at all he will mm -hmm. eat ice cream um he will eat baked goods that have milk in it but yep. he will not touch milk and i'm like dude it's the same thing in the ice cream and, he, and for him it's it's okay it took me a while to do potato chips and i love french fries more than anything really and now I realize that I like potato chips because I like the texture of them and the way that they crunch because eating is very sensory. Yes. And it's just beginning to hit me like, oh wait, I like certain things, not because of the taste or because I'm craving the salt, but I like the crunch and I like the ridges on the ruffles. Wow. Like the ruffle chips, I like their, the way that the ridges are like set up and I'm like, I like the way those feel. I want to eat ruffles because I like the crunch and the ridge and it's like the stimmy, like sensory experience. Like that's what I'm there for. So, and you mentioned something. So we're gonna That's a weird thought, but it's something that kind of has been on my mind recently because I'm thinking like, why do I like this stuff? No, and I love that because one of the things that, you know, I as a mom of a child who's on the spectrum, I always wonder, does the stimming still stay? And this is one of those questions that is not, you know, that I didn't, it's not scripted, but do you still have stimming tasks that you still do um, from day to day or every once in a while still? Um, you can't see my hands right now, but, I, but I'm always fidgeting with something, mainly because it makes me feel less nervous and it also brings me calm. So I am always playing with something in my hands if my hands aren't busy doing something. Like if I was, if I was writing or typing, obviously I wouldn't be, but normally, yeah, like I always am fidgeting with something because it just makes me feel normal. It makes me feel good. And when I'm really, really excited, you see my hands flap. I realize I love to, I love music. I feel like there's so many sensory experiences that we do just because it makes us feel good. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I, you know, that I, my son and I put, and I'm put this in quotes, he's finally bought into. Mm -hmm. 
before he was very embarrassed about his stimming. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to cry. I'm going to be good. He was very, <laughs> I'm going to get it together. He was very um, concerned, you know, about people watching yeah. his stimming. And, you know, and I explained to him, I was like, you know, this is- I always tell people, I'm like, I wish you could, I wish you could experience the full body joy of when my hands flap. Yeah. Like, I wish you could experience that because you don't know how good that feels when you were you that know, happy that your whole body wants to do your feelings. I agree with you. And when I see him, it's like, you know, it's like you described, it's the whole body motion kind of a thing. And once he finally like settles down and calms down, he comes up with all these brilliant ideas. And it's like, dude, all of that from humming and flapping your hands and from jumping, you know, and he's like, yeah, that's how I, how I think better. Mm -hmm. I'm, like, I'm, I'm that like, way too. I'm like, if schools could have like, you know, places where kids could stem and it was just okay for them to stem, mm -hmm. it would be amazing. The exactly. It's there's just so much happen. focus on like, sit still. And I'm like, but I, and I realize now I, even when I sit through seminars and stuff, like I can't sit still. And that's why I'm kind of grateful for zoom with everything in the pandemic. So I'm like, okay. If I need a break or I need to move or do anything, go for it. And I know every time that I ever get, I give seminars, I always have a note. I'm like, look, I don't care if you need to stand up. I don't care if you sit on the floor. I don't care if you're crisscross applesauce. I don't care if you are moving. I don't care if you leave halfway through because it's too much to handle. You do you. If this is the best way for you to get information, I will try to give you a visual and audio cue. I will do what I can, but you do you. This is judgment free. Learn how you will. I love it. I love and it. And I feel like you have to have faith in people because I think about all my friends who also have like ADHD and for them, it's not that they don't want to listen. It's that they just need to be moving or have yeah. something going on at the same time. Exactly. So you heard it here, guys. <laughs> I'm that way. I was that way too. I had a teacher in high school that was always upset that I was doodling the entire time. Mm -hmm. And she was even more upset when the grades were good yeah. because I always did really well in her class. And she's like, but you don't pay attention. I'm like, I am. I just need to be doing something. And of course, because it was me, my doodles were very elaborate and actually looked like works of art at some point. And she's like, you're not paying attention. I'm like, I am. Yeah. And, you're and right. then you look like you're not paying attention because you're too busy trying to focus on something else other than looking at someone. And then you're trying to also calm your own like body down. And then it's like, but I was able to repeat like anything she was lecturing about. And she's like, okay, okay, kid, you could, you, you, you do you. <laughs> and, you know, and that sounds just like my son. I mean, there are some times that it's like he's doodling, he's playing Legos, and it's like, are you paying attention to me? And then he can tell me everything that I said back, and I'm just mm -hmm. like, and I think that's more so of our uncomfortability. as Exactly. Like, it's just social norms. Like, I know if I look at someone straight in the eye, there's a good chance I will miss everything you say. And then yeah. you'll be like, but you were paying attention. But paying attention doesn't always look the same. It doesn't yeah. It's that we assume that a certain behavior means that we're paying attention. It just means that I'm paying attention. I'm making you feel comfortable rather than mm -hmm. listening to what you're saying. That's good. That's really good. And I hope people listen to that. You know what I mean? Because they're adjusting to our world. And then honestly, it's our time to start adjusting to what individuals on the spectrum are going through. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, like I tell people, I have learned to better support my child, not from the vantage point of being an educator, a special educator, not from the vantage point of being a psychologist, but actually watching him work with his mentor who too is on the spectrum. Exactly. That's where I realized that everything that my son was doing was normal because society and societal norms and, you know, book teaching was telling me, oh, he shouldn't be doing that. Oh, this is wrong. Oh, this isn't mm -hmm. right. But to see someone else who who got it, who did the exact same thing. I can't tell you, Haley, how much of a piece that was, you know, mm -hmm. because I was that mom who was trying to fix my kid so that he wouldn't get bullied in school, you know, mm -hmm. because I've been in education for so long. And exactly. I feel like there are certain strategies that it makes sense because I did certain things in school to try to fit in just to not get bullied either. But then it's like, how do you balance that need to avoid that hurt while also still being yourself as authentically as possible? And with younger kids, I think that's a really hard, like, especially like adolescents, that's a really hard balance to find. Because I feel like I would have to know certain things socially, like when I was in high school, it was all about the Twilight books. Like, of course, I knew everything there was about Twilight. I could care less about vampires. I still don't care. Right, right. But I knew everything. I had to. 
because it was something that I could at least talk to other girls or at least seem like I, w- I knew what I was doing. And then eventually I found my own people, my people, and it didn't matter so much. But I feel like you had to have that surface level knowledge. And I always treated it kind of like, I always looked at it like being a secret agent. So it didn't feel like playing for, it played, felt more like fun than playing pretend and also like being something you're not. And I'm like, you know what? survive and then you know you can find your people to thrive with type thing too like you will find your people at some point yeah. and i i feel like i found my people later in life and that's okay like yes. like i met one of my best friends in college and yeah. and we're still really close like it's great and then i and then i think about all the autistic people i know where you, there are no real rules that it's very different like how we interact with each other is very different than how we interact with neurotypicals that's awesome. That is, and, and, and like I said, you know, as an ally, as a parent of a child on the spectrum, it's always great to hear, you know, um, hear stories like this, you know, because one of the things that we as parents are often concerned about is, will my child ever find a friend? And I love the part um, that you that you were very truthful and honest in saying that I just found my friend later on in life, and it's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm still friends to this day, and I think that's. One I think of the, the long term friends has always been a harder thing to find because I've had friends come and go, like most people, because you change, they change, life gets in the way. But there are a couple of friends that I've had long term, and I realize it's because there's just that acceptance. Like, I'm pretty sure my one of my best friends is definitely neurotypical, or or he is some form of neurodivergent. None of us really know because he's not like diagnosed with anything, but he always is like, there's probably something with me, but who knows? But it's something that we joke about a lot every once in a while, but we just have this understanding like, okay. Even with, and I know when he talked, like the other day he was talking about reading audiobooks. And I'm like, I can never read an audiobook because I need something visual mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because I can't, my attention span won't retain it. I'm a visual person. I can never do audiobooks, but that's really cool that so and so is narrating that book. Yeah, I love it. And it's not that I don't care. It's just like, and he's like, but you should. He's like, you should get the book though. And I'm like, like go read it. And I'm like, okay. Exactly. Right like that's kind of how. It, and you realize that it's about values. Mm-hmm. You realize friendship matters on values and you realize that having that like ingrained sense of justice and what, how you were raised plays a big part in that too. And then you realize that it's not that you don't have friends because you don't have the social skills. It's just that not everyone shares the same values or places as much emphasis on them that you do. Mm-hmm. I love that. And that's okay. It is. Because there are things that I take really seriously. Like I know I, I like to trust people and it t- sometimes it takes me time, but I value that trust and honesty really highly. And a lot of people just aren't honest about a lot of things. And I'm like, just mean what you say and say what you mean. Yeah, right. And then there are people that you do that and they think it's harmful when you do that. And it's like, but I'm just communicating the only way that makes sense to me because I don't think you want me to lie to you. Mm-hmm. You're right. You are absolutely right. So before we close out um, today's show, is there anything that you want to share with us? Any upcoming events that you have? Any upcoming book projects you may have? Um, anything that you may be doing within the next three to six months that you want people to know about? Please let them know. As well, as how can they reach out to you if they wanted to know to learn more about your story, learn more about getting your books, and all that great stuff? So currently what I'm working on actually is I am writing another book, which is really exciting stuff. I'm writing about neurodiversity for lawyers, which is something that I think is really progressive and exciting because the legal profession has not been the greatest about lawyers on the spectrum, clients on the spectrum, or people that are otherwise neurodivergent. So it's not just an autism book. And I really like to preface that because the definition of neurodiversity does, in neurodivergence does include our friends with ADHD, learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and psychiatric disabilities. So I like to make sure that this is a very wide net and it's inclusive as, of as many people who might feel othered as possible in this realm of neurodiversity. So making sure that we're able to be more inclusive as a profession, because I know for anyone who's ever interacted with the legal system in any which way, it's kind of a nightmare in its own special way. And I want to make it easier. And I also want other attorneys like me to have the same opportunities as non-disabled attorneys, because there is a huge culture of stigma and different perceived weakness around invisible disability and neurodivergence. So trying to help bridge those gaps 
give employer strategies under with the ADA and also how to be more accommodating in law school and even things like juries and it's just really a huge undertaking. It's really exciting. The best part of it is I get to talk to all sorts of people because there really isn't that much out there that is encompassing of everybody and that's inclusive. So part of how I get to learn more is I get to talk to people all day. So I get to talk to other lawyers who might be autistic. They might have ADHD or dyslexia or whatever it may be. I get to talk to people who've been involved in the system in some way and hopefully create something that is helpful to whoever needs it. So I'm always looking to talk to people. I'm hoping that this will be out in 2021, but this is my current long-term project. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Haley, for joining us. Once again, my name is Dr. April J. Lisbon. I am your host of Finding the Superpowers Within. We thank you so much for listening to us, for tuning in. Be sure to share this broadcast with those who you may know that may be on the spectrum, maybe someone with ADHD, you know, someone even with a learning disability, because the more that we learn from our millennials and Gen Z, the greater we will be able to change our society so that we can create a better world for ourselves. Thank you so much and have a great day.